Episode 178 of CVP Cast with guest Dennis Bakvalov, recorded December 5th, 2018. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. And by JetBrains, maker of intelligent development tools to simplify your challenging tasks and automate the routine ones. JetBrains is offering a 25% discount for an individual license on the C++ tool of your choice, C-Lion, ReSharp, or C++, or AppCode. Use the coupon code JetBrains for CPPCast during checkout at JetBrains.com. In this episode, we discuss a new feature in Visual Studio 2019. Then we talk to Dennis Bakvala from Intel. Dennis talks to us about performance analysis and optimization. Welcome to episode 178 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Berving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, no real news on my side. How about you? Mm, no, uh, I guess. Well, next year is starting to get busy, by the way, for training activities for me. I've gotten a lot of contacts at the end of the year, but um, that's about it. It's always exciting. Yeah, we're we're approaching the end of the year very very quickly. November went yeah. by real fast. And the next thing I have coming up is the first week of February for uh, C++ on C, mm-hmm. where I'll be teaching that one day const expert class. And so I have all of January to uh, make sure everything's fully prepared and ready to go. That's good. Very good. Okay. Well, at the top of your episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week we got a tweet from Barney Deller. And he was replying to our episode with uh, Lenny last week, saying, it's nice to hear that I'm not the only one mob programming in C++. Thanks, CPPCast and Lenny. And yeah, uh, mob programming sounded really interesting. Uh, I've heard of pair programming, pair programming but never uh, mob programming. Yeah. Well, I've only heard of it from Lenny, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. Uh, you can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at cpq feedback at cbcast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes joining us today is dennis bakvlov dennis is a c++ developer with almost 10 years of experience he started his journey as a developer of desktop applications then moved to embedded and now he works at intel doing c++ compiler development he enjoys writing the fastest possible code and staring at the assembly dennis is a father of two he likes to play soccer and chess dennis welcome to the show Hi Rob, hi Jason, nice, to, nice to meet you. I'm excited to be here. You know, I should say probably that, um, I'm your regular listener from the episode number one. <laughs> so I'm, oh, wow. it's, yeah, awesome. so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here as a guest, not just a listener. Yeah. So you were actually listening from the beginning or did you go and catch up at some point? No, I was actually started exactly at probably, okay, my, maybe I'm lying a little bit. It was not the well. episode n- number one. It was probably the episode number three. Uh, I probably, it, it was the episode with Manu, uh, Sanchez. He was talking about okay. the PyCode. code. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it was kind of really in the beginning. So I'm kind of with you yeah. guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that was episode three, right? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for uh, being with us for so long. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dennis, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these and then we'll start talking about more of the, the work you're doing at Intel with performance analysis. Okay. Sure. Okay, so this first one is a meeting C++ and meeting embedded trip report from the Conan team. And I think this is the first year with meeting embedded, right? Yes. Yeah, so they went to, to both conferences and uh, they, they said the meeting embedded uh, conference was was quite good. Uh, they presented a talk there and uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to see that they're uh, going forward with this uh, new conference. I hope it does well for them. 
Yeah, I still want to listen to that talk. Uh, we stopped teaching C. That's still on my list to do, but I haven't. Have you looked to see how well the uh, videos are going up? I haven't. I'm, I meant to because I was interested in watching Andre's keynote from Meeting C++, which is also covered in this trip report. Right. Yeah, so the uh, the what is the next big paradigm was Andre's keynote, and uh, I'm a little curious as to, to what it was really about because in this trip report he says... Uh, he first explored how the next big things for C++ programming in the general world were perceived at the very beginning. Threads, online voting, NLP, privacy and ranges. I'm, I'm not sure what they mean by online voting. Like, do they mean political voting? I don't have any idea. Yeah. So I was curious about that. I need to go and, and watch his talk. Yeah. Dennis, did you go to Meeting C++ or Meeting Embedded? Um, unfortunately, not yet. Yeah. But actually, I also saw that, uh, th there were a number of talks about the performance and about the, the data driven, um, um, data driven development. Um, mm. so this kind of, I think, becomes the trend. I, well, I'm not sure, but that, that's, you know, uh, that's my just guts feeling. Um, I might be wrong, okay. but probably everyone see, see it, uh, how it, how it wants it to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, I just I, checked their. Um, I'm sorry. I, I just checked their YouTube page, and I don't see any uh, conference videos from Meeting C++ 2018 yet. I agree. I, I did not find any. Were you gonna say something else, Jason? No, that's what I was gonna say. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Was were there any other uh, highlights either of you wanted to make about the uh, Meeting C++ trip report? No, I don't think anything else jumped out at me on that one. Although it does look like there's a lot of interesting things that went down here. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to some of these talks making it online. Yeah. Okay, the next one is uh, introducing the C++ Lambda runtime, and this is from the AWS blog. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I've never heard of AWS Lambda before. Have you, Jason? I have. I have friends who okay. use AWS for all the things all the time because of work. Right, so... I, I guess AWS Lambda just allows you to run like Ruby or C Sharp or, or other languages and just the code is kind of run without having to worry too much about the server configuration is my understanding of it. Yeah, it tends to be like this like simple like snippet like you have this thing that you want to do and just do it and then give me the, uh, the uh, artifact results back or whatever from it. Right. So now you can do that with C++. Uh, they have an SDK and they have a pretty thorough example here, both doing a Hello World and then doing a more complex uh, AWS Lambda application with C++. Yeah. And the, the example they give here is basically like, uh, I think, kicking off a transcoding of something. I think that's the final example. C++ encoder. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, seems uh, pretty exciting if uh, you're interested in doing more in the uh, server and web world. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then the next thing we have is uh, the SIMD Visualizer project, and we were talking with Jeff Amstutz two weeks ago about SIMD, so I thought this was a pretty interesting tool. Um, you can run it just by going to this page in your browser, and it, uh, you know, it basically has a bunch of code in, in SIMD, and you can kind of see what it does line by line in a nice uh, visualization. It did either of you play with this on the website? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I, I, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, so I I played a little bit without uh, with, with it. So it 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 looks really cool. Yeah. Um. I I think it's just an, another um another way how we can how we can leverage the Clang and and, and its uh, uh and its tools because I I assume it it's it, it is made based on uh on on on, on Clang. Um. It's, 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 it's really cool. Uh, I, I, I still, uh, myself still am using, um, the, the paper and the pen kind of to visualize mm. how, 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 uh, the vector code will, uh, uh works here. So, so th this tool is really handy for, uh, for, for beginners at least. Right. I was, uh, kind of hoping that the example would not rely on intrinsics, but have something that showed what the compiler would generate, but this doesn't, it's almost like I want like a, a melding of like 
the output from Compiler Explorer piped into mm-hmm. this so I can see what the compiler actually did. It's actually in a class I was teaching last week. Uh, we were looking at some uh, uh, SIMD stuff that was being generated by the compiler, and I was reasoning my way through about three quarters of it and kind of wishing there was a way to easily visualize it. Right. Yeah, it, it'd be nice if we could kind of take the type of code Jeff was talking about with his SIMD wrappers and be able to visualize that. Right. Yeah. Okay. And <clears throat> so, oh, go ahead. Dennis, yeah. Sorry. So, so probably like with assembly instructions, it's it's also not obvious, right? I mean, j- just even fr- from from their names, uh, it's not obvious what they are doing sometimes. So, <laughs> oh yeah. So, <laughs> just uh, to, to have to have this kind of tool that will. Uh, that, that will tell you, okay, now I'm doing addition with, with, I don't know, two vectors. Now I'm doing subtraction. So it's like pretty, pretty handy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the last article I have, uh, just was announced the other day that the Visual C++, uh, Visual Studio 2019, uh, which there's now a preview out for, um, is going to have the live share feature. And I think they first announced this feature. I'm not sure if they mentioned C++ when they first announced it. But this is going to allow you to, you know, from one Visual Studio instance, um, kind of send what you're working on and, and let someone collaborate with you who's, you know, maybe at some other remote location. And as long as they're using Visual Studio or if they're using Visual Studio code, uh, the two of you can then work together. You can see what you're debugging together, see the call stack, see... Uh, you know, different variables. So it seems like it's a pretty powerful feature and should really help, uh, you know, remote developers. Yeah, then the example, they say Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code. Mm-hmm. The thing that's not obvious to me would be if somehow it could be a mixed environment, which I would assume not, because that sounds like that would be extremely difficult to get right. But no, it, it actually, no, it does look that way, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. One person using Visual Studio could share to someone using Visual Studio code. That, that is my that is reading. That's what it out. says. Yes. All right. Well, that's kind of awesome. Yeah, yeah. And this is definitely something I see myself using because uh, I work with several developers who are in other locations. And, uh, you know, we talked so much about pair programming and mob programming last week, but uh, being able to do pair programming with someone who doesn't, you know, sit right next to you would be uh, would be nice with this. Well, and it says there is a host and guests, so you could do mob programming with it as well. Okay, so multiple people watching you, and then have like a Skype session or something to talk to them. I guess. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. The guest even gets IntelliSense from the host. Ah, uh, yeah, that could be pretty impressive. So, Dennis, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit more about the work you do at Intel? Yeah, uh, sure. So, um, so um, my team uh, and, and me, well, we are doing uh, mostly the development of ICC, uh, uh, w- w- which also uh, known as Intel compiler, but not limited to that. We're also uh, contributing to to uh, LLVM open source project and uh, and uh, and GCC. Um, so. Um, so like, uh, m- m- we basically make sure that we, uh, I, I mean, we, the, the, the compiler generate the, the highly, high quality optimized code for, um, x86 platform for Intel architecture, uh, specifically. Um, we, um, also enabling, uh, new instruction set architectures for, uh, for new CPU generations. Like, for example, when, when the new, uh, CPU is, uh, going out. Uh, we need to have support uh, for them in the compiler. Yeah. So the compiler will generate, generate kind of new instructions, um, for, for, for new types of, uh, hardware. So that's basically what, what we're doing. Uh, uh, so when you say you contribute to LVM and GCC, that, that is the kind of things that you contribute as well as to their optimizer code yeah, generator. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, uh, cool. Um, so I guess, Building on what you just said, you said when a new processor architecture is going to come out, you're going to make sure that it's supported well. So if it's, if I understand you correctly, you're going to be making sure that GCC and LLVM are ready when the CPU goes correct. live, basically. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So um, what type of work do you do with uh, optimizations exactly? Yeah. Um, so... 
Um, so, so basically we are, uh, kind of try to find new, opti- new, um, optimizations in, in the compiler. Um, we also try to kind of tune, um, existing ones. Um, so j- just for example, to give you an idea, we have, uh, we have, so let me maybe first, um, explain li- like the subtle difference between, uh, between w- what we are doing and le- let's say, let me say, uh, let me call it the standard, uh, dev- uh development. So we have our, we have okay, the okay. fixed, uh, set of benchmarks and we are not touching its source code. So we have, we have them fixed, uh, but the, uh, each new day we have, we'll have the new compiler, uh, built from sources. Say it will be the, like the new Clang that, that, uh, that, that was built from the latest revision. And then we will take this compiler and we'll try to build all these benchmarks and then we'll, we will run them. So, uh, um, and, and well, it can happen and it usually happens that new version of compiler will, will generate the different assembly, different code for, for the same sources. Yeah. So, and that can cause okay. the performance regression or, or gain. So, uh, that, that's how, um, we, we, um, we are tracking the compiler performance. Yeah. So, and of course, uh, if there is a regression, we, we should go and fix that. Well, if it's, fi- if it's, uh, fixable, let's say, um, yeah. And then we are, uh, of course, also trying to find new optimizations, like, uh, what we can do, for example, to improve this benchmark. Um, uh, and, well, I should, I, sh- I should say that that's, uh, those benchmarks that, that we're working on, they are not, uh, contrived in a sense. They are, uh, real world applications, but just, uh, but just, uh, limited or, or let's say cut it, uh, uh, to resemble a real benchmark. Yeah. So for, 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 for example, okay. I don't know, uh, let's say the Perl in, inter- uh, uh, in, in- interpreter or for example, GCC compiler, uh, so we use our new version of compiler to build GCC and, and then this GCC will, 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 will compile, uh, some, some sources and we will benchmark it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's kind of, um, what, 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 what we are doing. Um, speaking of optimizations, okay. um, well, like the most typical optimization, um, I don't know, well, I can speak, uh, uh, probably, w- uh, like about my real work because it's kind of proprietary, but, um, but j- just to give you may- maybe a taste, um, for example, we tune the inlining, uh, like f- for, 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 for example, should we inline this particular function or not? Um, mm-hmm. then we also try to, for example, tune loop, uh, unrolling v- vectorization, like should we vectorize this loop? Should we unroll this loop? If, if we should unroll this loop, then, then how much? Um, and, and stuff. Um, but also, like, for example, um, like, well, so the most, uh, the most part of the optimizations are tr- try to, uh, tr- tr- try to deduct something from the source code. Like, for example, uh, if you have a v- virtual function call, um, but then, uh, you can see, like, the whole program and then, uh, in this whole program, there is only one instantiation of, of the base class. So there is only, it's essentially mm-hmm. only one client that implements this interface. So you can be safe in just converting this virtual f- function call into direct call. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of, uh, okay. I, I know, the, the basic, uh, kind of optimizations, um, what we're doing, what we're tuning. So, yeah. so you said, I'm no, sorry, no, no, uh, go sure. ahead, Fear. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, you said a new version of the compiler uh, will often change things. And if I understood, you said you're doing like nightly builds of compilers. Like, do you see like on a daily basis that your performance uh, characteristics change from nightly builds of LLVM? Like, are you monitoring that closely? Oh, yeah. yeah, frequently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, frequently. Like, wow, that's yeah. So I'm, I'm I must say that that well, of course. Uh, it's always, there is always some noise there. So we, we kind of try to right. filter this, uh, this noise. So, for, uh, for example, uh, if I don't know, if the benchmark, uh, regressed by, I don't know, 0.3%, we probably will not even look into this. But if, if right. the benchmark regressed, I don't know, 50%, then I don't know, it's a kind of a red flag for us. <laughs> um, right. 
Well, if it also increased by, I mean, like, it got better by 50%, is that also a red flag? Do you assume something got broken in some weird way? Mm, well, um, well, it's not always broken, yeah, Be- because for, 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 for example, let's imagine the benchmark, which consists only of one, um, one hot loop. And for right. example, yesterday, the compiler was not able to vectorize it, but today, Compiler right. suddenly starts vectorizing this loop and wow, we have uh, 2x performance. So that's, uh, that's possible. I, I mean, it's not, po- it's not probably, uh, it's not probably, um, common for, let's say, it's not happening every day and it's not happening mm-hmm. for the, let, let's say, for mature, uh, benchmarks, uh, which, yeah, okay. because, uh, the, let's say the most of the benchmarks ha- have multiple hotspots, not just a single loop, right? Um, so right. it's, 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 it's really, uh, it's really rare that, 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 uh, we can see on the nightly builds, we'll see such a jumps, uh, in, 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 in performance. Okay. How do you go about, uh, finding new optimizations? Yeah. So this, uh, the, the most complex part of, of, of our work. So, <laughs> um, sure. So, well, uh, so basically we're doing performance analysis. So now what is performance analysis? Um, um, well, usually we start with profiling the benchmark. Yeah. So what is profiling? We try to find the hot places in the benchmark. Um, then you kind of can, uh, can just, uh, go and probably you, you, if, if you look in, in, in into the profile, it will show you, um, the hot, uh, source line, uh, source lines, um, or maybe assembly instructions. If you will go, uh, into this assembly view, um, and then you probably can spot some inefficiencies there, or you will come up with, with some idea that how you can make it better. Well, so this, of course, also requires you to, to, to have some uh, knowledge in reading assembly. And I'm, and, and I know that, uh, not a lot of people these days, uh, are, are like doing this. I mean, uh, looking and reading assembly, but, but still, um, the, this knowledge is, is, is really essential for, uh, for, 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 for doing good performance analysis. Um, um, yeah, so, um, so uh, what do you try, uh, what you can try to do next is, for example, you can, uh, uh, you, you, you can try and ju- just hack the assembly. If it's, I, I mean, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. if, 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 if you can do this, so, uh, doing like, uh, quick experiments. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So take the binary and say, well, what happens if I replace this instruction? Well, yeah. I, so, so you, you cannot, uh, uh, modify the binary, right? Uh, because, okay. well, it's not, it's not tri- trivial to, to do this, but, uh, you can, uh, emit the assembly, uh, listing from your program, uh, like, right. and kind of go from there. Or actually, so, um, like, mm-hmm. There are maybe also the high level, uh, the higher level, uh, tools that you can use. For example, the, the compiler has something that is called optimization reports. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's also actually, uh, in, integrated into the compiler explorer. So, uh, there is a separate kind of window that you can, uh, put, uh, on the side, um, with, uh, along with your source code and assembly. And it, uh, th- th- right. those optimization reports will show you what compiler did for you, uh, like w- with, with your loop, for example, was the function in, uh, in, in line or not? So, uh, just even without looking into the assembly, you can, uh, you, you can know what to expect when you will look into the assembly, right? So, for example, if you, if you, if, you, if you see that the, the compiler inlined your function, well, okay, you probably, uh, you, you, you will, you will probably not find it in the, in the, in the binary, right? Because it was inlined. So, right. um, and the same goes for, for loop unrolling. It shows you the, the, the factor, uh, with, uh, uh, with which the loop was unrolled. Uh, it shows you the vectorization, uh, r- report. So was the loop, uh, v- 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 vectorized? If yes, then what, what was the vectorization factor? And, and so on, yeah. So th- this kind of a higher level. For example, if we see that, that the loop was not vectorized, well, then we probably will 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 think like, oh, okay, is it possible at all to to vectorize? If yes, 
then uh, then probably it's a matter of cost model, and we should and, and we can probably tune it. Yeah. Okay. So when you make one of these determinations, you say, okay, this loop could probably be vectorized. You prove that you did, and then you implement some changes in the compiler. How often do you end up causing a regression in some other bit of code? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's actually the, the question that I was expecting. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, and it happens all the time, really. I, well... <clears throat> oh, yeah, unfortunately, okay. it happens all the time. I actually, I actually have a number of 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 great examples that you will like. Yeah, so <laughs> okay. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so like usually when you have a like the, really the big suite uh, of benchmarks, uh, it's not mm-hmm. it's not really possible that that you will optimize one benchmark without regressing the others. Um, it's just, okay. it's just, it's just, it's just, uh, let's say a reality. We can, we, we should, um, all agree with this. Um, but so, so, uh, actually, so the, the reason for this, um, uh, well, okay. And, and you might actually might be doing really a, uh, a good thing, a, a good thing. Yeah. I, I mean, you can do a real good optimization without really harming everything else. But still have a regression mm-hmm. on, on some benchmarks. So like, for example, uh, your optimization removes, uh, a couple of, uh, unnecessary assembly instructions. Yeah. That's, that's clearly, okay. that, that sounds, sounds like, like a, good a really thing. good, de- good, good yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, right. and, it, it, and, it, and there is no way how it can, how it can affect, let's say, uh, other benchmarks in a negative way. Right. But for, but for some uh, okay. reason, but but for no. some reason, you see that, that the, oh, you have a, a regression on 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 some other benchmarks. So, um, and the reason is this uh, for, for for this is actually quite quite interesting. And now let me may, maybe give you an example. Um, uh, so imagine you have a a benchmark with, with only one hot function, and just a mm-hmm. just a simple okay. function. Let's say it's take one uh, one ar- array is just iterating o- over this array and I- increments each element by one, for example. Um, and life is good. You have some numbers uh, for your benchmark. Uh, you you are tracking it, and then one day uh, someone inserted another function that is that, that is completely called that is uh, no one is calling this this function, but it happens to be just. Before, uh, the, f- the function that you are measuring. Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of just stays in the binary. It was not eliminated from, from the final binary by the compiler. It's just there. Um, but what, okay. what happens is just actually that your hot function was moved, uh, down in, in, in the binary. And now it's, it has mm-hmm. the different offset. Yeah. And just by doing this, right. uh, I saw the cases, uh, um, where performance goes up or down by 25%. Like 25% is just huge. It's just in- enormous for yeah. us. Like most of our optimizations are like inside 2%, 2-3%. Like if we implemented some optimization which which gives, I don't know, 5%, it's like, I don't know, we can celebrate right now because it's just a huge money for Intel. <laughs> yeah. So, mm-hmm. um um yeah so i i actually wrote a blog post about this uh so and, and yeah oh, okay. uh, w- w- with exactly this uh this thing uh this notion and uh well th- this problem calls the uh it, it is is called like um uh, code placement or code alignment uh, it depends uh wh- okay. wh- who you ask um yeah so uh, and actually so if we if if we look into this so the only thing that changed is the uh, is the layout uh, of of this function in memory, right? Nothing else uh, was touched. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so and, and and it's not only uh, l- limited to the fact that was uh, now my function. So 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 is now my function occupy uh, multiple cache lines or not? So uh, so it, it's well it's usually um, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I was just thinking through what you're saying. So like if it, 
was in one cache line, but code yeah. pushed it, and now it's across yeah. two cache lines, or code pushed it because it was across mm-hmm. two cache right. lines, and now it's in one yeah. cache line. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we should probably say that it's instruction cache line, right? Yeah, but right. Uh, yeah, but it's not limited only to ca- to, to I cache to instruction cache. There are also a number of of uh, structures uh, in the CPU front end, which kind of uh, which can be the bottleneck in this in 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 those kind of cases. Um, okay. Yeah. So what do you do about it? Yeah. Like once this <laughs> has happened, like do you have any way of fixing this or? It seems like it would, it would make the binaries get very large if you tried to always ensure that every function started on a cache alignment correct. or something. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So, uh, so the first problem is that the um, that that the binary size goes up. Uh, but but the second problem is that if you will try to insert knobs into the binary, uh-huh. uh, okay, you can probably insert them before the function. Um, that's probably uh, w- will cost you nothing. Because they will still not, they will be not executed. Um, but right. what say, uh, but actually, so the, the functional alignment is not the end of the story. So we can also align the loops. Um, and, the, and if we will okay. uh, misalign or choose the, the bad alignment for our loops, uh, we can also, we can also cause damage to, uh, to let's say, uh, to our performance. Um, right. So, and if we will try to align loops, we can insert the knobs that will be executed. That's probably still uh, still cheap, but not uh, but not let's say cost free, right? Because okay. it's still we still need to fetch them and decode the, the knobs, right? And and then we'll we'll probably just just throw them away. But still, we need to fetch and decode them. Um, so and actually, uh, well, and it's, yeah, go ahead. It seems like the knobs are also taking up space in the iCache. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. In the in the iCache, and also there is a um, de- de- dedicated uh, UOP cache. It's uh, another um, structure in in the front end, which kind of uh, try to caches uh, the the instructions after they were decoded. Yeah. So we so it's okay. I didn't yeah. know that. Existed. So it's it's okay. kind of. Um, when we are when when we when we already f- f- fetch the instructions and now we try to to fetch it again we will not fetch it because we already have it decoded in 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 our UOP cache so, so called UOP cache right. or decoded cache yeah okay so I'm I'm gonna risk making this more complicated in, in the questions <laughs> here that we're talking about but. You so uh, a function gets added, it changes the cache alignment. You do something to tweak things so that you get back the performance loss, whatever. Maybe you come up with a no op that you is worth the cost, and then, well, you're I don't know hypothetically you're testing on an eighth generation core processor, and then do you go and see what the impact was on adding that knob to like a fourth generation processor, or like do you? Do you test regressions backward, or are you always on the latest hardware? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, we do this. Uh, we 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 also track like like the uh, the the, pre- the previous generations, um, but well, well okay. let's say to some extent, yeah, because uh, because well, again, the, uh, there is always noise, and we we should we should s- right. s- somehow right. defend from 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 this noise, so. Um, Okay. So probably what what we can do actually we can we can uh, and 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 we are doing probably this uh, we making the threshold for for noise for the older platforms like a little bit bigger than uh, so uh, than the newest generations so we are we are looking closely okay. to the uh, C, to the uh, CPUs from new generation we are looking a little bit loosely for uh, for the uh, previous generations it also of course depends on the on how big the regression or or gain is yeah. So if if the gain is like mm-hmm. say let's say ten percent, well it's it's big enough for us to start investigation. But well, I I I, I actually should say that that okay, uh, I said twenty five percent is probably somewhere on extreme. Um, usually mm-hmm. we, we we see the jumps around like mm, uh, from one to five percent. It's okay. Well, it's probable that that some some benchmark. Uh, Will will go up or 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 down by 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 that amount just from the code alignment um, issue issues. Wow. Yeah. 
And, uh, and now I'm curious, like, uh, cause I know that GCC and Clang at least have this option and I have not spent a lot of time with ICC, but I believe it tries to at least be command line compatible with GCC. If I have that correct, where do these things come into play? If I do like dash M tune and say, I want to tune it to this specific CPU or something, do you then like, do you do these kinds of tiny little details of tuning, taking into account these things between processor architectures? Yeah. So I'm actually, so speaking of code alignment, I'm not sure if, if, uh, if there is a, well, okay. Um, well, code alignment or other, well, alignment or other like some oh, yeah. kind of Oh yeah. Oh sure, yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Um, yeah. So uh, actually, so, uh, in general, I mean, it's a good idea to, uh, to pass those flags if you know that that your uh, your application will run on a specific uh, type of hardware, let's say on 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 the Skylake's CPUs on six on 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 six uh, generation of 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 Intel core architecture, then of course you can you mm-hmm. you should just go for it and 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 pass all the flags needed uh, sp- sp- special flags for okay. for targeting specific uh, generation of the CPU. Um, you yeah, do yeah, that. sure, yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. Um, but well, if you, if you want to be a little bit conservative in this, you, you can probably go for a, for a minimal, uh, version of, of the CPU that, that, that you know for sure this is the minimal. N- n- uh, no one will try to, to use the older, uh, c- CPUs for, for running your application, then you can just, yeah, choose the, the, mm. the okay. more, more appropriate, um, flags. Mm hmm. Okay. I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. So we've talked a lot about um, benchmarking. Can you tell us a little bit about what types of tools you use for performance analysis? Um, oh, yeah, sure. Um, so I think li- like the go-to tool for uh, for profiling is, is like Linux Perf. Um, so this tool is okay. capable of doing most of the things um, um, like the engineer needs to uh, to to perform uh, to 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 do performance analysis and optimize the uh, the application. Usually, when when perf is uh, Linux perf is not enough, I go for Intel Vitune. It has a nice GUI and a little bit more capabilities than 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 perf. But actually, uh, besides from that, uh, I also used like the good old bin utils. It's just uh, Obsdump, NM, like the, the tools that we are all all uh, familiar with. Um, so the point here is that, well, it's actually uh, nothing stops stops you from 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 doing performance analysis right now. So uh, all well, okay. m- most of the tools uh, are free and 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 they are amazing. Like for example, Perf. Um, it's it's ju- it's just amazing what Perf can do. Um, yeah. You've mentioned Compiler Explorer. I have to ask. How often do you use Compiler Explorer to give you a quick snapshot of comparing what your work has been across different compilers? Right, correct. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I actually was thinking about how I, how I can how I can make this work for me, um, but unfortunately, you know, we have we we have the brand new compiler every day, so for me, right. it's kind mm-hmm. of impossible to in, in, integrate. Uh, Integrate a new version into Compiler Explorer. Well, I, I actually, I, j- I just haven't spent time on this. Uh, maybe it's possible. Yeah, if you're running it locally, it would actually be pretty easy right. to do. I actually, kind well, I don't make a build every night, but I I do just use whatever my nightly build is. Yeah. Right, but then you can you you you, you should in- integrate them all 
um, into into the compilers, oh. or I mean, if you have a number of compilers, uh, nightly, nightly snapshots, snapshots being yeah, pulled in. which were built. So you should somehow then integrate yeah. it and then keep the history. And then what what happens, for example, like, okay, so um, most of our work is is uh, on remote machines, yeah? So I'm not developing on, on, mm-hmm. on, 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 on my laptop. I We have a, a number of dedicated servers that we are just SSH into and then go from there, kind of build the, the compilers, build the benchmarks, run them. So it's kind of, I think will be pretty hard to do right yeah it would be it'd be a lot of work probably possible see if matt's listening and he decides that you can add a wild card for your search for your compiler or something and right (laughs) (laughs) yeah so I'm, i'm curious like as you're like optimizing this code and working on all of these benchmarks what kind of things do you see as like really hard to optimize like what should what should C++ programmers stop doing so that they get better code out of our compilers? Yeah, so... Um, well, the most obvious thing is, is like, do not try to uh, to do the compiler's work because the, the compiler is probably better than you at this. So, yeah, like, you know, uh, the, the probably the, the general advice, like, do not um, unroll your... Uh, unroll loops yourself. Um, compiler will probably do it better. Um, I don't know. Okay. Do not try to inline things. The, the compiler will, will probably still do uh, do it more aggressively than than you can. Um, what about the inline keyword itself? Um, or always in. I assume you would say don't do always in line because the compiler knows better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, um speaking of uh, in in inlining um inlining keyword. From the top of my head, I'm not sure if, uh, so, if this, uh, if this keyword is actually still, uh, still, uh, makes sense. Well, it, uh, obviously the, the no inline attribute makes sense because it's, it's kind of prevent the compiler from, from inlining. Um, yeah. Okay. But, so actually, I, I remember th- there was a great post by Simon Brand who, uh, who, who, who actually, uh, dipped, uh, uh, dived deep into, in, into specifically this, Problem like is inline keyword is still makes sense. And he he okay. he has a great uh, article on this topic. Okay, I'll look for that. So yeah, so don't try to do the compiler's work. Uh, I like mm. that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then what I like uh, it's almost a little depressing how you said something so simple like adding a function can push our code around and have implications that we never right. expected. Yeah, what do we do about that? Like, do we worry about that at all? I mean, yeah. Uh, so actually, we spend uh, some efforts on on trying to to figure out how we can solve this problem. Um, and actually, so we okay. we haven't uh, we we haven't I mean uh, got to any 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 good good decision about this. Whenever we choose, like for example, okay. to uh, to align, let's see, all the loops by by for example. Uh, by this 32 bytes boundary, let's say, some of our benchmarks go up, goes up, but some were, uh, some of the benchmarks still goes down. So, uh, in uh, in the end, it's still kind of the same. The performance is, is still kind of the same. So, um, okay. um, so this this problem is still kind of unsolved. Uh, and and in, the, okay. in this problem, I should say, uh, is the, probably the most um, mm, the most harmful for us. Uh, for for a compiler developers, because uh, because the problem here is that you cannot rigorously test your optimization, yeah, because some of right. the benchmarks will go go up, but some goes down, and you want to know why they goes down. But the reason probably is that j- just because of the noise and 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 the uh, um, um, and different placement, uh, different layout, yeah. And there, is, there are actually actually more also uh, interesting problem. Like for for example, okay. So let me now ask you the question. So how how do you think does debug information affect affects performance? Like okay, so we pass the minus g option to to the compiler. It will it will emit yeah. all the mm-hmm. all the these sections uh, in the binary with debug information. So I feel like it must have some effect because it's yeah. making the binary larger. 
just because of that right, reason. Right, but then we, okay, then, then, then we start thinking that, okay, so the debug information is just stays in the binary and, and in, in the run, in the runtime, it's not even loaded into the main memory, right? It just stays on the disk. Okay. So, so how, uh, I mean, well, probably in ideal world, it should not affect performance, right? It sounds like a trick question, honestly. <laughs> like. Right. So actually, uh, so what we did, uh, so I, and, and okay, uh, just saying upfront, I saw the cases when, uh, and I actually worked on the cases that, uh, you pass the minus G option, um, uh, and you have, uh, like, okay, so you're building the same application, you pass the minus G option, uh, and bu- bu- building the binary number one, number A, and then you, uh, build the same, uh, application without, um, without debug information, so without passing the minus G. You have the binary number B, and then you st- strip the debug information from the binary number a, uh, from the binary A, and just the dump in the assembly and compare it. Uh huh. And, and it's, it's different. different yeah. I'm <laughs> okay. So uh, it's not that different, let's say, but but there is some difference still. So for me, it's still kind of magic. I mean, I mean, I mean there is no way how it should be different. But I definitely saw the cases and did differently, uh, 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 and it definitely um, affects performance. So I'm, I'm, I mean, in a, in ideal world, the answer to, to to my question is no. The debug information should not affect the performance. But I mean, we're not living in a, in ideal world, so <laughs> so so the 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 answer is is well maybe or or it it depends. So um, and, uh, well um, so I think. Is that because the compiler has to emit extra things for the debugger to be able to like know? Okay, this does have a memory address or something like that. Like maybe like is it that's is that what's um, going on? I'm not sure. I'm not a, a, an, an expert here. Okay. It's also still a, um, still um, an open question for me. But I tend to think okay. that uh, that probably uh, it it could be a j- just a bug. Um. Or maybe some heuristic uh, for for some particular optimization. Uh, there is some specific uh, specific heuristic that sees that, for example, if my um, like for example, if my function is is that long, I, I will do this. But if if my function uh, and actually so so the all the uh, all the debug information is stored uh, in for example for for LVM it's stored. With some uh, with some uh, specific function calls like like uh, LVM debug um, and metadata, so um, so maybe just some some optimization just take this debug information into account, and they should not do this. So right. so uh, I'm 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 not sure what's the, the the real answer for for this is. Maybe if there if there are some uh, really um, compiler experts. Uh, that are now listening this ep- this episode can can maybe comment on uh, on, on this problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 So so yeah. Uh, um, um, and in general, uh, performance analysis is quite uh, tricky tr- tricky thing to do because, for example, um, uh, once I was working on um, on some uh, regression, which was five percent. Five percent regression. Okay. Um, so and and actually, what I immediately spotted was that uh, the good case has the fifty percent less instructions uh, retired, or mm, le- let me say for f- j- j- just for simplicity, executed. Yeah. So so okay. the the good case executed fifty percent less instructions. So this should be definitely, I mean, better and and and, and good. Um, so and uh, right. and when I started looking in, in, into this benchmark, I saw uh, I saw the patterns uh, like uh, in the good case there was just one assembly instruction that was doing, uh, for example, in incrementing the value in 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 some memory location. Yeah, so uh, it will be like in the x x six assembly it will be like inc inc increment. And then some some memory mm-hmm. location. In the bad case, right. this exactly instruction was just splitted into three, assembly, three assembly instructions because still it's a read modifier write operation. 
So we are first loading okay. the value from memory, then incrementing it, it, and then storing it back, right? So it's still read, modify, write. Right. In the bad case, uh, it, it, it was the same uh, instruction, but just unfused, let's say. It was uh, explicitly okay. load, explicitly uh, incrementing some temporary r- register, and then uh, storing the value back. So... Yeah, okay, so when okay. I spotted this, this was like, well, it's, it makes no sense. Like, like there is clearly like 50% uh, more instructions executed. Uh, like, this should be the, the reason for, 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 for the performance regression, right? Like, right. And, uh, um, and then, uh, I actually, so j- 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 just went back, um, and then, uh, kind of, um, consulted with one of my colleagues, uh, which told me that, uh, well, but 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 still, it's the same amount of work for for the CPU to do. So and then right. what I what I actually what what I actually uh, done, I just uh, I just uh, put this uh, assembly instructions in a tight loop, and just benchmarked only um, only li- like this tiny loop with just only one assembly instruction in the, in the good case and just three assembly instructions in the in in the bad case, and it showed exactly the same performance. So uh, okay. so. Uh, the the thing here is uh, what what I wanted to tell is that uh, it's you can be easily fooled uh, by by just uh, uh, a number of for, for example instructions that were executed. Right. So and it's not that obvious that it can cause the performance regressions or gains. Yeah. So and and in my case, okay. uh, the number the uh, the fact that that the bad case executed fifty percent more. Instructions was not the reason for for a for a performance regression, yeah. So it's it's hmm. always tricky. You always need to be prepared. Um, you always kind of need to uh, uh, need, need to dive deep. You always need to to know how how the hardware works um, and stuff. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, Dennis, um, I'm definitely going to put a, a link to your blog in the show notes, but do you want to uh, share that with listeners who might want to read up more about uh, some of these performance tuning examples you have? Oh, there? yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I think you will probably just, just share it in, in, in the shared notes. Yeah, I mean, the link. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So actually, I, I also wrote uh, a number of, uh, of the beginners kind of friendly um, articles, um, starting from the basic things like what is profiling, uh, what is the, I don't know, for example, the, uh, the instruction retired? What is the reference clock? Uh, how you can collect the other performance counters? Um, like, w- w- what you can do about it, about, about those counters? How, how to read them? How to collect them? Um, a little bit more of advanced topics, like, uh, like, what is the, uh, what are other capabilities of the performance monitoring unit and how you can leverage that? Um, yeah. So what you, what, what you can do with, with perf, for example. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, where can people, uh, find you online aside from your blog? Yeah. So I think the, the best, uh, place to find me is, is, uh, is on, on my Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is, uh, D E D E N D I B A K H D D Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the yeah. show today, Thanks. Dennis. It was, it was a pleasure. Thank Thanks you very much, guys. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Lefticus on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.